So thanks everybody for joining this afternoon uh, for our panel discussion on building self-service platforms um, with Apache Flink or for Apache Flink. I'm very, very excited to have this really good panel here today um, with very interesting speakers or panelists um, from different areas, like with different backgrounds, um, some coming from the public cloud um, and some coming from building internal streaming platforms. And my goal um, is to cover some topics for you so that you can um, learn some lessons on how to build a streaming platform for Apache Flink internally. Um, and we would start with a short round of introduction so that you have some background on where everybody's coming from. Um, so I'm Robert, I'm working at Riverica, um, and I'm working on Flink for quite a long time. And I'm currently focused on um, developer, um, like on growing the developer community for Apache Flink. And um, my co-moderator is Konstantin. And yeah, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Konstantin, solution architect, and now um, product management for for our platform, um, and helping Robert a little bit with the moderation. Thank you. Kenny? Sure, my name is Kenny Gorman, uh, co-founder and CEO of Aventador. Uh, should I give a little background on what we do? No, yeah, just, please. Yes. So uh, we've traditionally been a Flink as a service provider for the last couple of years. Uh, today we have a new flagship product called SQL Stream Builder. It is a first class, SQL is a first class citizen product. Um, it's really aimed at uh, helping corporations who are uh, struggling to keep up with building the stream processing jobs. Maybe they have data science folks, maybe they have just engineering folks or developers who want to have access to streams, want to have that kind of capability, but really aren't super familiar with the streaming APIs or aren't knowledgeable or up to speed yet. Uh, and so our platform provides that in the form of SQL. They can install it into their AWS account using their key pair, deploys into their account, and they're off to the races. Um, and we're really laser focused on getting those customers uh, a great solution, having it done in SQL, and really building a first class uh, SQL experience for folks. Cool. Yeah, uh, my name is Steven. Um, I work at Pinterest. Uh, at Pinterest, we've only just started using Flink for about a year. So um, we're pretty early in um, the development stages. Uh, I work on the streaming platform team myself. Um, so I'm working on building a platform uh, that enables um, developer velocity at Pinterest so that um, people around the company can build out uh, streams for all kinds of things. Um, advertisement, measurement, um, real-time analytics, um, and content quality are the two, or are, are the three uh, biggest ones coming in right now. And my name is uh, Enrico. Um, I work uh, at Yelp, the, I work in the data streams team. We, we use Flink uh, really to power um, a variety of applications. Uh, it's kind of really the core of our uh, uh, stream processing uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, we have been running Flink for about two years and a half. Um, it powers from the um, machine learning uh, uh, feature generation pipeline uh, to our entire connector ecosystem. Um, the way we extract data from uh, uh, data stores, maybe Cassandra, for example, and how we ingest data into things like Redshift, uh, uh, S3, Cassandra, uh, and so on. Uh, and we also do obviously um, data uh, real-time data transformation on Flink. Hi, my name is Ryan Nienheis. I'm a product manager on the Amazon Streaming Services team. Uh, we offer a couple different services that we uh, provide to customers to use streaming data, everything from streaming storage services like Amazon Kinesis Data Stream and Amazon Managed Streaming for Apache Kafka, which allow you to easily capture, store, and then process streaming data, uh, really focused on the storage side. To, uh, we have two processing options. One of them is a delivery-focused solution called Amazon Kinesis Data Firehose that helps you move data from point A to point B in real time. And the other is another service called Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics, uh, which is uh, a managed stream processing solution that allows you, uh, in the case of Apache Flink, to basically build a jar, upload it, and then we offer a fully managed infrastructure as a service to scale it up and down, uh, handle security, and things like that. Um, We've been doing streaming services for uh, 
more than five years. However, we're relatively newer entrants to the Flink space. Our managed Apache Flink offering, Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics, was shipped last year, uh, November, in November. So uh, we're coming up about a year of offering a fully managed Flink offering. Uh, that being said, AWS has offered Apache Flink-based offering through another service that we're probably not going to talk about much about today called Amazon EMR, uh, starting about three or four years ago. So um, maybe that's a question for Kenny and Ryan. Are there any use cases that you're specifically focusing on with your offering? Yeah, yeah so I can address that. Uh, so a couple things, I think, from a use case standpoint. Number one is, you know, streaming data it really helps customers and companies uh, build more competitive and more competitive, or compelling and more competitive applications, right? So that's why we're really trying to use streaming data in the first place. And so the teams that are building those applications typically struggle with velocity. I talked about that a second ago. Um, some of the customers that we've been involved with early on are fintech customers, uh, IoT customers, uh, which is, you know, it's a very wide uh, swath of types of use cases, everything from, you know, mobility and, and ride sharing and cars and things like that, all the way over to, to kind of the industrial IoT side. And those are really the folks that are struggling to kind of catch up and figure out how do I make sense of streaming data? How do I compete in my marketplace with that streaming data? And how do we like build apps quickly and easily so that we can kind of have that velocity and that competition? So those are the kind of couple three of the use cases that we've seen kind of really pop up. Mm, but I mean, you have a SQL interface, right? So you're focusing probably more on like on an audience that is more like in the BI or data science area compared to like a developer distributed systems yeah, it's uh, a good, audience. Right. It's a good distinction. So uh, our target customer, the ideal customer from our standpoint, is is everyone from a developer who maybe doesn't have the the chops in Java or Scala to build processors themselves or an organization that just doesn't have enough people to build all those processors and jobs they need to, to, to kind of create the things that they need for their business, or even someone up the stack a little bit who mm -hmm. maybe isn't you know even familiar with code that much, but knows SQL and wants to be able to build dashboards or, or you know, interfaces for things within their company. So you know, these guys have built those kinds of platforms within their company, and for everybody else, you know, either they have to build it themselves or they can use someone else like us. Yeah. How is it f for for AWS? Because you probably focus more on developers because people upload a job basically. Uh, so I would say that for our Flink based offering, absolutely. So uh, the, we're really focused on offering a solid experience from everybody from uh, the infrastructure engineer that's building a platform on Apache Flink to uh, data engineers that are building large scale uh, or even small scale um, Apache Flink jobs for doing streaming ETL and things like that. Uh, we do have a SQL based offering that's not based off of Flink that uh, from a user standpoint, I actually wouldn't say we go after data scientists yet. Uh, the streaming market is still largely technical developers like yourself. That's probably 70% of the market. And the remaining 30% of the market segment that we see are those that are perhaps less technical developers, um, meaning those that they haven't touched streaming data before or they don't have any distributed uh, systems experience. Or perhaps they're maybe they are a developer, but they don't have the time or resources to focus on real-time analytics. Those that are generally the developers that we see use the SQL-based offering. I think in the future, we'll see as uh, you know, as this community grows, as we build tools, as all of us build tools to make it easier, we'll start to see uh, even people that are analysts using streaming data in some fashion. But uh, right now, I think that even this, our, our, at least our SQL-based offering is just not at the point it's easy to use to give it to someone whose primary other tool is like, say, Excel. Uh, so we're still more on the technical focus side. And for the, let's say, internal streaming platforms, I'm curious to learn how is the internal structure? Like, is there a separate team that runs or provides a platform and then there's teams using this platform? Or is it more vertically organized that each team contributes to the platform? Um, yeah, for us at Pinterest, um, it's definitely the first uh, mm -hmm. the first suggestion you made. Um, it is, there's, we've got, I'm on the platform team who's um, building out um, all kinds of stuff like um, proving the metrics and deployment systems and that kind of stuff and even um, allocating the uh, the hosts that the Flink jobs will run on themselves and then meanwhile there's the individual teams with um, needs of streaming for example uh, the experiment analytics team 
Uh, they'll build out the job themselves. We'll help code review it and um, guide them through uh, just like ramping up on Flink. But um, I guess the the responsibility of the f the business logic is up to them and ensuring that the job um, works properly is mainly up to them, but we'll help them make sure that uh, their job's not using too many resources or that kind of stuff like that. So for Yelp, uh, um, I'd say it has changed over time. Uh, so initially when we started two years and a half ago, we had a pretty small team. Actually, there wasn't even a stream processing team uh, that was uh, looking after Flink. Um, so we started an initiative, started trying to integrate Flink, and then we actually got a lot of help from uh, product teams. Because uh, maybe they needed to have a um, connector to ingest that into Elasticsearch. So we'll get somebody um, on a product team who was excited about distributed systems, excited about infrastructure, uh, coming and helping building that component. And obviously we will provide guidance around um, like, like kind of best practices, and also have like, we very early in the days had like a sort of a spec around what the, for example, for connector, what a connector interface should look like so that we could build something that was uh, reusable and then like just kind of very modular so that anybody could just uh, like using a, a command line tool, maybe ingest data from a stream uh, into Elasticsearch or into Cassandra. So over time, uh, we started building enough team structure so we, we got a stream processing team uh, whose primary job is to look after Flink, run upgrades, uh, maintain clusters. So now if I look at the offering today, is uh, um, I would say like much more kind of so, sort of offered as a service. So we have uh, uh, teams that may want to build a custom Flink app and they will uh, uh, or a very specialized Flink app and we provide all the primitives to launch cluster, all the best practices around how to maintain clusters automated uh, as much as possible or uh, documentation for them to follow when they encounter issues. Uh, and then that is kind of for custom Flink application, but also the same team so in processing will uh, um, maintain those modules, uh, things like uh, uh, Flink SQL, our Flink SQL service, um, or uh, our connector ecosystem. Um, so it, it, it has evolved. Now we have many more people who can actually look after uh, everything that is uh, reusable and is uh, shared across uh, um, and kind of reused by product developers. Were there, were there generally also considerations going to the UI-based solution? We've also seen a couple of solutions in that direction in, at the conference. Instead of SQL, Kenny, you went with SQL in the end. Um, you also mentioned SQL. You already have an SQL. Is that basically the the answer for the less Java savvy folks, or is it a UI in the end, or is it something else, Jason? <laughs> so, I'd say the goal for us introducing SQL was. Um, really lowered the barrier of entry to uh, streaming. Yelp is a Python shop, so it's, uh, it's not that easy that product de developers will be very excited about working with uh, Java or, Sc or a Scala API. Um, so for us, uh, um, it was, uh, okay, what is the, um, something that is more familiar to developers, and the SQL was one of these. Um, obviously, you can solve uh, all of the use cases in SQL. Um, so there are some intentions there, but for some time uh, there was uh, how we were uh, kind of encouraging uh, uh, developers to adopt uh, uh, streaming oriented solutions. Now we are also providing a Python API through Beam, so that is uh, that will also kind of fill the gap between uh, really native, uh, probably potentially a little bit harder to use for our developers at least, uh, um, Flink data streams API. And then a very high level uh, uh, SQL API, but you can really solve 100% of the use cases. And then with Beam, we are sort of uh, filling the gap and getting also a Python uh, API that developers sort of will be hopefully more familiar with and be able to adopt to implement more applications. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, one of the things that you just mentioned that resonated with me is that uh, at AWS, we're all about giving options. And I think one of the awesome advantages of Flink is the approach it takes into a layered API for different experiences. So everything from the data stream API to the table API and the SQL API allow uh, 
people that are building platforms like us to offer different experiences to customers. So to offer the lower level primitives, if you need that flexibility and you need the control is quite powerful, as well as being able to abstract up for those different use cases where you, uh, or different users, that where you don't need that same level of control, where you want to build something quick, as, as you mentioned, uh, where you don't want, uh, someone doesn't want to have to ramp up on all of the concepts associated with Flink, it's a lot more easier uh, on ramp when they're using this native SQL experience. Yeah, and just to underscore that too, we, we've always been big believers in that. And you know, we underscore SQL. We've, you know, my background is actually in database engineering and database design and such. And so when Flink SQL came out, it was the natural place that I grav personally gravitated to. When customers started pulling the solution, kind of pulling it out of us, they said, hey, we want to be able to build these things faster. And, and some of this logic is relatively simple. But then they'd use, you know, they'd use Flink SQL and they'd say, hey, hey, there's this one thing I can't implement in Flink SQL. So one of the things that we came out with recently was JavaScript uh, UDFs. So you can just, you know, define something quickly and easily in JavaScript and then uh, using the Nashorn, uh, the Oracle Nashorn project. And then, you know, that, that turns into a Flink SQL job. So, you know, in one hand, you want the, the, the data stream API and all the power of it. And, but you also sometimes want the velocity. So I'm just, you know, needs the breadth of solution from top to bottom if you're going to be successful, it sounds like. Um, so I would like to understand a little better how you're interfacing with your users. So we've talked now about like JAS versus SQL and so on. But I'm curious to learn um, how does the user, for example, get feedback from the system? How can they look into errors or into metrics? Um, so I know that Yelp has a system where you basically have like a YAML file um, to define your, your job. But what happens after you've defined your job like this? Yeah, so uh, for what we call uh, uh, reusable components, uh, usually the way developers will uh, interact with these components is, as you said, um, they have a um, YAML file that's the configuration of their job. So um, let's say it's a string SQL job. Um, they'll um, uh, specify what SQL query they want to run uh, and, and some other parameters. Um, it's basically a configuration that translates into a job that gets automatically scheduled as soon as that config file is deployed uh, on a Flink cluster. So now, usually, for these are what we consider sort of managed components, because we have uh, our team managing them. So if something goes wrong, uh, let's say there is an issue in the cluster, we need to increase resources, maybe we need to scale it out. Um, usually the, the team, uh, uh, our team, data streams, will take care of that, uh, will be paged, uh, we have access to logs, errors, all sorts of things. Um, for uh, uh, users um, that are deploying these config files, we'll still actually give them access uh, to logs, uh, to the, even like to the Flink UI. Um, we have dashboards for metrics that we built and they are available. They just need to go to the, um, use the proper short link and find the uh, metrics that are specific, for example, the job that they're running. So if they're running a um, Flink SQL query, they'll find a, a complete dashboard uh, that contains all the metrics specific of their job or their query that they're running. And they will be able to also filter uh, uh, logs similarly. Um, we use a Splunk for uh, um, log analysis and visualization, so that's what they will uh, probably be uh, using that case. And then in worst case, they can still access the Flink UI. So we give them also access to, to see what their job is specifically doing. So they can cancel the jobs? If they want to, yes. Your team gets paged yes. then. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, considering that it's an internal use case, um, we we trust our developers. Mm -hmm. And also right now we are running on a multi-tenant cluster, uh, but in the future we are looking, especially for things like uh, Flink SQL, uh, to run on a, a dedicated like kind of one job uh, cluster. In that case, they will be able to only kind of hurt themselves. Um, so how do you handle then the resource distribution if you have one shared cluster for different teams or different use cases? Yeah, I'd say that so far uh, it's been surprisingly, it's been working surprisingly well. Um, <laughs> because yeah, we run, uh, we have clusters where we run over a paged. thousand jobs. You're going to get paged right now, you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not on call right now, likely. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's getting paged. Uh, but no, like, I'd say um, we have clusters where we really run uh, uh, over a thousand jobs. And I'm not saying that this model works for any company, uh, but for us it's currently working. We also keep reevaluating this model, being like, is this gonna uh, work one year from now? 
what do we need to change now so that we'll be able to scale uh, by next year? So we continuously reconsider what we are doing. Um, right now, maybe because of how the kind of jobs that we are running, uh, the volume, like, but it's working pretty well. Uh, it's really incredibly stable. Um, and also, like, if we need actually to um, separate these clusters, it's also pretty easy. Mm. Like we, we have all the infrastructure in place to spin up a new cluster and maybe move half the jobs to a separate cluster if we wanted to. So, Stephen, is it the same at Pinterest? Um, I think uh, the goal is to get to that point. Um, since we're so early on, though, um, the, the SQL... Um, Flink SQL is just not there for us yet. Um, we've kind of refocused on um, deployment for this year, and then next year we're going to take on uh, Flink SQL. So um, for us, there's no there's no SQL interface. So we kind of expect um, the the client teams to uh, build out their jobs with Java or Scala if they want. Um, from there, uh, we have a job submission service where they'll um, uh, make a request to um, kind of similar. They'll make a JSON request, and using the JSON request, um, the job submission service will be able to find the ar the artifact that they want from S3, and then find their save point, and then create the command that actually gets run um, on Yarn, uh, and then the job is submitted. Um, and then um, what else were we just talking about? So you're running on AWS. Yes, yeah, so we're, yeah, we're running on AWS okay. uh, as well. Is the app also on AWS? Um, so we, we started running uh, on uh, EMR, and we are currently in the phase of migrating over to uh, Kubernetes. Okay. But yeah, we, we run on, on uh, AWS. Um, so even uh, Kubernetes um, will be running, is running on uh, uh, in-situ instances. Do you provide any um, guarantees from the from this orchestrator system to restart failed jobs automatically or to have some like state management features that it knows like it can track state <laughs> yeah absolutely um, we built all of that automation early in the days when we started running on EMR and honestly EMR for us was a, a great way to get started because we, we were going from uh, <clears throat> knowing zero flink to actually having to build a flink infrastructure and we didn't want to spend time really learning how to run Flink. We wanted to learn how to write Flink applications. And then on kind of second step would be how to run Flink. That in, in that case, the EMR was really just perfect for us to get started. So now that we have uh, uh, enough expertise around how to work with Flink, like the next step for us is uh, how can we run Flink in a better way than what uh, uh, we get right now with the EMR. Um, in terms of automation, uh, we developed all of the tooling that we needed uh, um, to, for example, page if something is going down, monitor, handle a, a save point, checkpoints, uh, um, do uh, automatic job restarting, do automatic job launching. So kind of all of that sophisticated part uh, uh, was necessary in order to be able to run, for example, a thousand jobs uh, on top of a single EMR cluster. Mm -hmm. So Ryan, what's the experience of running a Flink job? on AWS from a like interfacing perspective? Like how do how do I get feedback from Flink? Um, so I think as you just mentioned, there's a couple different ways to run Apache Flink on AWS. Uh, one is on EMR, one is on our Kubernetes service, another is within our fully managed uh, serverless service, Amazon Kinesis Data Analytics. Um, so the interface is different for each. If I focus on the last one, uh, the essentially we have a native API, uh, AWS API experience. So you build and test locally with your Flink job. You make sure that it's running correctly. You, you then compile your jar, and then you either upload it to S3 or directly to our API, and then you call create an application and then run an application. Um, and then we offer very CRUD-based uh, operations, both for state as well as for uh, applications where the both kind of first-class citizens in our service offering. Um, when customers want to debug the application, again, it's a very like uh, AWS-centric experience. So we offer monitoring via CloudWatch, which is our uh, CloudWatch metrics and logging service. So all of the Flink metrics, or most of the Flink metrics, get admitted to CloudWatch metrics. Um, almost all of the Flink logs get admitted to CloudWatch logs. And then you have got uh, tooling that is AWS specific to, to basically alarm on those metrics, so on and so forth. Um, we're, so that's generally the interface a customer interacts with the service. Mm -hmm. But yeah. what, what, what were generally like, 
problems that users were running into that you didn't take into account in the beginning? Not, not just at AWS, but also um, at the others. Like things that went wrong for users that you weren't expecting. So I think one of the things that when you are building a platform that simplifies a lot of the setup, you tend to attract users that may not have the expertise to diagnose problems. So when it's super simple to get started, when you just debugging something locally and then uploading it. Sure, as a managed uh, service provider or as any of our, the platforms we provide, um, we take care of some things, but we don't take care of everything. So if your application like has OOM errors, as an example, we're going to log that error, but there's no way to address actually service code issues. So uh, one of the things that I think that I wish we would have provided is, I mentioned we just have monitoring solutions, but I wish we'd provide even better monitoring and even better access to the underlying infrastructure so that uh, customers can uh, self-service fix these issues. Because at the certain times, like our teams get paged, I get paged, <laughs> and uh, we have to help diagnose customer application problems. We have to help fix them, app their, fix their applications. Uh, a lot of times we have to teach them design principles, and this is all stuff we'd rather address up front, but when you offer a super nice getting started experience, sometimes people just go straight into uh, maybe improperly designing their application. So that's one thing I wish we would have done a little bit better job. Yeah, I can address that too. I, we see a lot of that as well. I think support is a key thing there. Having someone that's always going to pick up the phone or answer an email or get on Slack and, and help customers out. Again, you know, Flink, we're, we're a number of years into it, but still it's relatively new as a technology. And so I think users need help. Sometimes it's simple stuff and we're, you know, we're happy to do that. That's, that's our job. Um, we, we mentioned deployment around Kubernetes. I just uh, add a point there, if I may. Uh, we invested about a year ago in starting to really build around Kubernetes, and that and that's how we did. You know, similarly, uh, we deploy on Amazon. We deploy our own Kubernetes cluster and management interface. Um, and our decision, th our, our thinking there was, you know, we we built uh, management interfaces to handle the command and control of Kubernetes. We call it Builder, kind of. Not very creative with the name, but um, and it handles things like you know restart, uh, start, deployment, scaling, you know all those types of things. So, f relatively similar architecture and design kind of um, structure as the as the other folks from a Kubernetes standpoint and deployment standpoint. But so in your case, you will also log into AWS um, or CloudWatch and AWS logging services. Yeah, uh, it depends. Like I said, we have a you know we've we've have a, a service that's you know managed Flink. We've had that for a long time, and we have a number of customers that are doing that. And those are those are obviously enterprise customers. They're scaling. A few of them are global, and yeah. And for that case, um, you know we're hands on helping those folks be successful all the time. Um, those are the same folks that interestingly were like, hey, I want to. I have these ten or fifteen or a hundred you know Flink jobs that we rely on for our business that are super important. And we're doubling down on Flink. So that's the trend that I see is that people are saying Flink works, streaming works, this is awesome, let's double down on it. And when they do that, then it's a matter of like, how do I scale the organization? How do I get more people to, and I think that's probably what drove you guys to create your internal platforms, right? Is just being able to scale that type of service. So and we see a lot of that coming from that, uh, you know, from that managed service business. Yeah, I, just to echo a couple of different points that you just mentioned. Uh, a lot of times you've got standard metrics and logging, but then there are special applications or special customers where you need to basically customize your monitoring to alarm upon. And one of the things that, uh, again, like lessons learned, it's one of the things that's difficult for us is to classify an error on our side versus classifying an error on the customer's side. So it's one of the things that we've been working on internally that uh, I eventually hope that we contribute back to the community is that basically the ability to identify an issue and then um, help either a customer or help our team uh, classify it and then help them either through self-service tooling or through back in our teams getting paged, the support mentioned that you just brought up, um, to help them address that as soon as possible. I, I, I guess that one of the things that uh, makes a sort of support a little bit easier on, at least for us, is that uh, all of our uh, like customers are actually internal and um, we can give them a uh, full access to the cluster. So for example, recently we had uh, an issue in an application was, a, was doing a very complex uh, processing and uh, the way for us to actually debug it was to start profiling uh, in production and give them access immediately and with uh, to all of our profiling tools and even debugging tools to a, a production uh, like cluster. Um, 
so it's a, obviously it, it is something we can do because our uh, users are um, at Yelp, like <laughs> there are other Yelp developers. So we can literally sit with them, uh, look at all their code, uh, and do all of the uh, debugging and pretty much uh, troubleshooting together. It can be tough, though. I mean, just just somebody creating a job with some crazy window size and state goes, that's the most common one. And you're like, why why, why are things so busy? Why, why is this job completely broken? And it'll happen at 3 a.m. on a Friday, for sure. Like, it's just guaranteed. Uh, that's when they launch their jobs. So, you know, that's, I mean, that's just kind of life right now. And I think the community is addressing that in a number of ways. Um, state management's getting more robust. And, and the Blink changes are fantastic. Blink Planner and those kind of contributions are starting to make... Um, you know, kind of, you know, bring velocity to some of those issues and stuff. But there's still the Wild West in some, in some degree. So is, is things like SQL or more high-level interfaces, is, is it making it easier for you to, to debug these things? Or is it making it more difficult because more people are just trying out things? I, I can, I'll just address that one real quick. I don't want to step on you guys. Uh, you know, one of the things we talked about, uh, what is the interface and how do people interact with it? Uh, we built a, a, a pre-parser and basically the way it works is you, you issue some SQL, you get immediate feedback on that statement, whether the schema was, if the schema is correct, if the statement grammar was correct, and you're going to get feedback right away. That's not like you don't wait for the job to go out to, to the cluster or anything. You get, you get that feedback right away and then you have access to the Flink logs as well. So you got some, you got some pre kind of pre-processing logic in there to help folks, you know, not deploy inherently broken jobs. Um, SQL does help that, you know, it's, it's a simpler, it's a simpler language. The grammar is, you know, everybody kind of knows it. Um, so I think that helps to some degree. Uh, but overall, it, you know, it's, you know, I, th I still think that uh, helping people understand what they're, what they're, what they're asking of the cluster uh, by building jobs, whether, it, you know, they're using a lower level API or whether they're using SQL. I think that's a, that's kind of the, you know, the, the thing we all should be trying to achieve is really, uh, helping developers and helping people create jobs and be effective at deploying them and making them great. Yeah, I definitely connect with that. Um, even though we don't have uh, Flink SQL at Pinterest yet, um, definitely the biggest thing is just like helping people understand what they're actually doing with the Flink jobs. I don't know how many times I've explained watermarks, but uh, I don't think I'm going to stop anytime soon. <laughs> um, and just like that, like, once people start to get it, like it becomes so much easier. We've actually had um, one of our client teams, um, one of our first teams that built a Flink job, after teaching them um, how it all works, they've actually come back and helped us debug another team's job um, because they had more experience with actual like hands-on debugging jobs considering they owned one of the jobs. Um, so yeah, education is definitely uh, really key for us as well. One of the ways we... Um try to help ourselves uh, uh, like solving these sort of issues is by limiting uh, the flexibility that we give to developers. Um, so we, we come up with some best practices and we make sure they are uh, encoded maybe in the abstraction we provide. We, we don't give just access to um, Flink as it is sort of like, hey, here is a main, just write your Flink application. Um, we have like some um, wrapper classes. We, we don't really do much customization on the data stream API, but we provide enough wrapping uh, uh, that... Um, for example, make sure that the proper serializer is in place. The state is set up in a specific way. Um, the overall uh, uh, configuration of uh, the sources is done in a specific way and also for the watermark. So that kind of allows us to cover, i say, probably the 90% of use cases. People don't even need to ask those questions. Like potentially some users don't even need to know what a watermark is or how it's configured. We try to do that out of the box. We say, okay, this is the right way. We know how our infrastructure behaves internally this is the watermark logic that you need. Uh, then obviously there are use cases that are more complicated and they require some customization. We offer that, like they, they can customize. Um, but really like we try to cover, like we, we try to avoid having a lot of developers asking the same question. If they're asking the same question and the answer is always the same, we can probably just encode it and make sure that uh, they use the best practice out of the box. So it's, it's kind of like an... SDK internally for Flink is this that our similar? Uh, yeah, I will say it's a yeah, it's an SDK. Basically, we have a library uh, that is our wrapper library, and uh, any internal user uh, building an application will use that library. 
but they still have access to the uh, all of the Flink API. So if they want to, like we are not wrapping around Windows or uh, uh, Maps, like that'd be um, a bit crazy uh, for us. Like yeah, it's impossible to kind of keep up with the um, our upgrades and open source project, but. We try to provide at least the minimum uh, amount of uh, standardization that allows users to do the right thing without thinking too much about it. With AWS, are there any restrictions on state size, on parallelism, on any of that? Or uh, so echoing what you just commented on, we we choose, uh, when you run a Flink job, we have an SDK. It is the, the AWS API experience. And when you run a job, we set you up with a series of default configurations, some of which are static, which are some of which are dynamic, almost all of which you can override. Um, so in many, many cases, we're, I would say we're okay about you run a job for if your job is a relatively standard job, uh, we're either dynamically change configurations to help you do with your state, or will uh, our static settings are just best practices that work for like 95% of jobs. That being said, there are, uh, uh, there's a lot of self-service adoption, and uh, through our APIs, if someone overrides a setting and or they have a unique use case, perhaps that we haven't seen before, we, that's where we generally run into issues. Um, I think back to the original question where you talk, uh, where we talked about uh, control, and I think it was mentioned by several of the other panelists. When you can control the user input to help them succeed in solving the problem that they are out there to solve. Uh, without give them giving them the full flexibility, you're able to scale your platform a lot easier. Uh, some users are going to need the flexibility to change what's uh, going on underlying, but if you can either through config files or YAML files or SQL uh, help them achieve their goal without them having to, you know, opening up the underlying infrastructure for them to shoot themselves in the foot, uh, you're definitely going to be able to scale your platform a lot faster. So we try to do both, but at the end of the day, I, same thing with the layered APIs, you've got to offer various options for different customers. Those that want to override all the settings that you provide, as well as those that don't want to learn any of the config that they have to set up for Flink. Yeah, we kind of handle it the same way. We have a menu of options. You can kind of pick from the menu, but you can't have you know everything a la carte. Uh, of course, if we're doing a customer, there's some big enterprising We'll do whatever, but for the most part, you're choosing, you know, a menu item, and, and that's for the most part best practice. Things we've learned, uh, common failure points, and honestly, you kind of know when you engage with a customer, um, you know, one on one, where they're where they're kind of at in the in the curve of adoption. Are they power users? Do they totally get it, or are they um, are they just starting out and do they kind of need some help? And we typically guide them in the right direction. Say, hey, be over here. We want you to use a SQL API. Try this or try that. And this will probably make you more successful right off the bat. Or, you know, they have 100 jobs that need to be in production tomorrow. And so, like, okay, let's get those things live. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, um, one of the things, there's two things that bring me joy with our customers. One is, like, we find out months after the customer went in produ production. Oh, so, yeah, we adopted you went in production, and we didn't hear from them. It's like, oh, great, you had an awesome experience. And on the flip side, when customers really, really struggle using the service, running into limitations and everything like that, that's uh, a little bit more painful, but it's also a great learning experience for us because we're able to update our platform to accommodate for that. I think that's uh, when you, you know, build a platform either internally or externally as a service, one of the advantages you get is that you can learn from other customers and apply those updates so that everybody can take advantage. And I think the same could be said from the larger Flint community as well. So I would like to talk a little bit about the future. So what, what plans you have and how you want to evolve. Um, I don't know who wants to start. <laughs> Flink SQL for us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sounds like everyone else is already doing it. Um, <laughs> so that's definitely something that we've had on our roadmap uh, for next year. And so that's um, one big thing. Um, I think also uh, Enrico mentioned um, generating like the, all the metrics and alerts um, for a job kind of like automatically. Um, that is something that we're also definitely looking into. Um, something that a lot of uh, the client teams at Pinterest have really been requesting. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. For Yelp, uh, um, I think uh, one of the main challenges that we'll see um, coming up in the next few months will be how to um, get a sense of all the complex pipelines that we are building. So with the modular infrastructure that uh, I was describing earlier, 
what happens is that um, now we are building really complex pipelines. We have uh, maybe 10 stream SQL queries and then uh, join through like what we call join edits, another component and those are like maybe another four joins and they're all together then go maybe uh, to another connector and maybe uh, Elasticsearch. And uh, when developers are building these complex pipelines, all, all these components are connected through Kafka topics. So when developers are building these pipelines, they go on the whiteboard, they know that they have components, they draw everything in the whiteboard, and, and then they go back on their laptop, they write a bunch of config files, they basically have to write almost no code, and uh, they deploy it. It works, it's like, oh, that's great. But obviously, that pipeline evolves over time. And once you implemented that, that, that art architecture they were uh, uh, drawing at the board, whiteboard is gone. Now you have a bunch of config files that are distributed across maybe one or more repositories. Maybe some of the components was activated through a command line tool. Um, so it's a, I feel like from the maintainability side, uh, it becomes a little bit of a challenge, especially if you want to evolve it. Now you need to go back to the whiteboard, understand what is running, um, visualize it, and then modify it and kind of make sure that is everything properly propagated. So what we are looking in, in the future is to actually consolidate and unify that entire process. Um, we are uh, starting to look into kind of what we call a pipeline uh, builder API, um, where um, we'll uh, give a level of abstraction on top of all these modules that we've built so that, for example, in a single, uh, uh, let's say, Py using maybe a Python SDK, um, people like developers will be able to define a complex pipeline full in Python and then underneath we will translate that into whatever sequence of uh, uh, Flink jobs connected by Kafka topics and connectors that we need to, to run automatically like to, to be able to implement the pipeline. So they always refer to the same pipeline and the same pipeline maybe identified by a name will be used to identify metrics, logs, um, save points, um, and all of that. Yeah, I can go. So uh, we have a long list of kind of features that we're adding around logging and visibility. I, I mentioned that earlier. That's a big, a big thing for us, making sure that customers can see what's happening on the Flint cluster and, and do something about it. Everything from metrics to logging and, and accessibility of logs and those things. Uh, more sources and syncs, Kinesis, JDBC, Elasticsearch, all those kinds of things obviously make tons of sense. It's super cool to just write a SQL statement and have the results of that go right to Elastic or something like that. So that's cool. We want to continue that roadmap. Um, but the real, the kind of the last, and then add more cloud providers. Today we're AWS first and we'll continue, we've invested in Kubernetes, we'll continue to go down that route um, with other cloud providers. So that's kind of another thing. But the real big thing that we're trying to solve from an engineering standpoint is, you know, I talked about that customer kind of further and further up the stack trying to utilize streaming data. And so one of the things that we're building is the ability to have a materialized view or a snapshot view, a time snapshot view of your results of SQL. So even though it's a streaming SQL, it never ends, it's a boundless query, you're still able to materialize that over some state. Maybe you're accessing it in um, like a single page app over REST and being able to just get that data and then build a map or whatever. So um, that's kind of the use case we're going towards and that's one of the big things that we're working on. I think that last idea is an excellent idea. Um, we're focused on a couple areas. Uh, the first and foremost is AWS is always focused on incrementally improving availability, scalability, security. So it's the things that quarter all of our services works constantly trying to improve their, uh, improve time to update your applications, reducing the downtime, that type of thing. Uh, second of all, is you, we, I kind of alluded to this when you mentioned like what mistakes did you make. So we have an AWS API experience, AWS metrics experience, but uh, the Flink community has done an awesome job with some of their experiences. And many of our customers say, we want to use the AWS experience for this, but we want the Flink, more of a native Flink experience for that. So uh, this is related to uh, us offering options for the customer. So if you want to use monitoring through the Flink UI versus using our monitoring and dashboards, you have that option. So a bunch of our roadmap is making sure that the, not only do we have an AWS experience, but we also have a native Flink experience associated with it. Um, and the third thing is on building things using Flink. So building abstractions like the great idea that you just mentioned and other things such that customers do not have to um, 
ramp up on all of the fling concepts. They just get the, the at the end of the day, the access to the timely insights, the uh, ability to get to improve their business with more real-time data uh, without actually having to ramp up on all of the concepts. So those are the three areas that we're generally focused on in sort of the midterm. Thank you. So um, I'm thinking about opening up for um, questions from the audience. Um, who has a question that you would like to ask? Uh, three questions. So then I will ask one quick question and then we open up for the audience. So my question is, um, if we could do a wish, if you could do a wish list for the Flink community or for the Flink developers, um, what would you like um, to have from Flink? Looks good for Flink. I mean, I'll start. Uh, uh, I mentioned availability is a big deal. Flip one is a really big deal to us. It's something that we've tried to, like, uh, as a team, have uh, failed to contribute back to the community, but it's something that is very important. So I know that's very specific, but uh, definitely something would be on the top of our wish list. Uh, yeah, I can kind of tackle that. Uh, so we, one of the things that we've been working on is better logging, and more, more verbose logging, especially around the SQL API. So that's an area that I think is under development. Um, you know, we've added some things there. So there's, um, so there's that. Um, uh, and I think just more conferences like this. I, you know, this has been, I've, this is like our second conference now, and it, man, it's been awesome. So just, I think more of the same of, the, of this kind of thing um, is, is, really, is really great. A lot of great folks here. Do you, do you guys have anything to add, or should we open up for questions from the audience? Uh, I was uh, just going to say, probably an area of interest for like kind of wish list would be uh, things like uh, um, actual dynamic scaling uh, or like auto scaling. That'd be really interesting to see. And then like I, I see a lot of potential on the uh, SQL API side. I think it's uh, sure it works. It's good to some extent, but I, I, I see a ton of potential there. Things like uh, being able to uh, support uh, um, table change log, materialized tables directly on the uh, SQL side. Um, really give customization to how you do uh, windowing, windowing uh, how you fire the results from a window. Um, I think... Uh, we are kind of scratching the surface there. And then there is also like maybe, um, I think Blink to some extent is able to do something similar, like look, look up on an external uh, um, data store. Like imagine being able to join a stream and a Cassandra table uh, or using a, something like maybe an elastic search as a source uh, and join a stream to that. Um, it's kind of, I guess, a bit futuristic. I'm not sure like how that will play out in reality, um, but I think there is a lot of interesting work that can happen there. Yeah, and I guess for us, um, kind of visibility stuff is kind of important to us. Um, uh, some of our clients have been kind of asking about like how much RAM is my uh, RocksDB instance taking up, or how much disk space am I using, um, and so. Um, since our cluster is multi-tenant, um, we have had some issues where uh, a RocksDB instance gets so, so big that no one else can use the disk anymore and then jobs start crashing. So um, just having the metrics in there to say like, oh, this is how much you're, you're using, your jobs are using way too much, so you should fix that um, would be really nice. Cool. Thank you. So there are some developers here listening. So, <laughs> so who has questions? Let's start here. So looking back at the first time you became operational, uh, what are the biggest changes you have done in your platform sense? And uh, what are the, the things that stand out as things you wish you, would, you had known at the time? Who, is that for anyone in particular? Yeah, anyone. I, I can answer that one. So we, uh, I mentioned we talked about Kubernetes earlier, and I was just in the Kubernetes talk. Uh, I think it was, uh, it was Yelp. You got a particularly good talk. Uh, we invested in that, and and we did pay the tax, the Kubernetes tax for that, as he called it, which I think was fantastic. Um, you know, there's there's good stuff about Kubernetes, and there was stuff that I'll just call investment time. It took a time to get things right, to get it to work with Flink. Um, uh, we didn't actually go the operator route. Uh, we didn't create a custom operator. Uh, but, um, you know, it, it works now, and it works quite well. And um, I'm proud that we got past that. But it, it was, for us, a small team, it was quite the investment. And it's, it's a really good question. Uh, we changed probably so much uh, since we started. 
Um, maybe one thing I will, uh, I could do differently. Um, it's probably like around uh, uh, job management. I will probably spend a little bit more time understanding uh, uh, the advantages of running so many jobs on a, a single cluster. Um, I feel like, for, for example, today we are not able to upgrade uh, to a newer version of Flink because of some issues that uh, appeared in the newer versions and they, they just sort of, uh, um, kind of emphasize by the, the way we deploy jobs, like this hundred jobs or a thousand jobs running in a single class today. Um, if I were running a 1.9, I wouldn't be able to actually run it. So we are stuck on 1.6. And if I were to go back, I'd probably um, think to spend more time, uh, maybe finding alternative solutions to, uh, to the model. Um, yeah. Um, I would say, um, it was related to the roadmap uh, point that I made, I, making sure that your developers have access to the, the native Flink tooling as much as possible is important. Uh, the other thing I would say is that I would, if we would have gone back when we originally shipped the service in November, I would have shipped it with two Flink versions instead of one, and the ability to upgrade as fast as possible. Because the community innovates very fast. So it's very important that as you offer internal service or external service, that your ability to take it, like provide that functionality to your customers, be it internal or external. Um, are there any other? Yeah. Um, this, this might be a question specifically for um, Yelp and Pinterest, but I'm open to also uh, the platform folks. But I'm curious what SLAs you offer to the people whose jobs are running on your infrastructure? Yeah, so we offer different level of SLA uh, depending on uh, what application we're running. So if you're running your custom uh, Flink application, um, what we, uh, the SLA that we provide is usually rendered around cluster uptime or uh, ability to, to deploy a new cluster. Um, if you're not able to deploy a new cluster for two hours, that's obviously bad because if you have a critical bug, you're stuck for two hours. So it's usually cluster uptime uh, and um, ability to deploy a new cluster. And um, for uh, uh, the generalized applications, uh, usually um, the thing that we kind of standardized on uh, um, providing is usually the delay. Uh, because when you work with the uh, stream processing applications, most of the times they can encapsulate uh, um, everything, everything else really. Like if you have downtime, that impacts your delay. Um, so usually end to end, like we, we call it a uh, um, component uh, level delay. It's basically delay from uh, uh, when a, a message was published to Kafka and when it was actually consumed by a Flink application. And that's the thing that we are usually, um, how we provide the um, SLA for the applications that we maintain, things like a Flink SQL, for example. Because in that case, it would be uh, maybe related to um, the cluster not being properly provisioned. And uh, because of the reason, some queries are falling behind. So we see the delay increasing. Um, Do you offer also latency through the Flink application? Uh, not really, not really. Uh, because even for uh, something like a SQL query, that's so dependent on what you actually write there. If you're doing a window over 15 minutes, <laughs> your, your SLA is 15 minutes. Right? Trying to figure out how many people are want a faster restart time because this, this impacts, for some of our more simple jobs, this impacts our SLA quite a lot. If the restart time is a minute, the P99 will go high. But I can understand for the SQL stuff, it's really a different world. Yeah, similar. Um, I guess like for us, it's also just based on like what the application is being used for. Um, we kind of just determine our SLA based on what is expected from us um, and try and meet that. Uh, yeah, um, it's not super strict yet um, since we're still rolling it out. Um, we're kind of still in a beta, but uh, yeah, we kind of just base it off of what the customer needs. Thank you. Uh, we offer a public SLA of 99.9% .9 availability, um, which is, sorry? The, the way we measure availability is pretty precise. So your application is up and ability, it has the ability to read data from your data sources. So if you have like back pressure or something like that, or there's a problem with your code down in the pipeline, no, the infrastructure is up, your code has network access and has the ability to read. 
Uh, internally, we measure it a lot stricter than the public-facing SLA. Um, right now, the disruption thing is a big deal for us. So, like, we're actually in the process. The emails in my inbox right now. Our engineering team's moving from measuring availability at the five-minute layer granularity to moving it to the one-minute avail uh, availability, and that's super hard because when you do disruptions for like code updates or reading state from S3 to restore jobs, it becomes um, very, very uh, more aggressive. So, like the the uh, the time frame in which you measure availability is super important, and disruptions are uh, like code updates, internal patching, that type of thing are probably the biggest hit that we take with availability. Are there any other questions? Yep. Uh, so, Enrico, you mentioned that you had a requirement of <clears throat> basically pipelines that encompass several different Flink jobs, right? That are, Sorry, can you, you? You had a requirement for pipelines that are basically kind of translated to several different Flink jobs connected by, by Kafka topics. I was wondering if the motivation of that is like performance or is more reusability of results or what the motivation is. And also if you had the inverse requirement, like multiplexing several applications in a single kind of physical Flink job. Yeah, um, I, I feel like there are different ways of uh, um, creating this uh, sort of a pipeline uh, or modularized architectures, right? Like the one way we are uh, using is one way. The other way is maybe we could actually make all of these components available as libraries, right? And then users will just import the module and write their own Flink app and that all the modules will be part of that, including connectors, um, extreme SQL, and so on. Um, I think there are some pros and cons of each one. Um, the pros that I see in the way we are uh, using it and implementing it is, first of all, is isolation. So a failure in one component does not affect any of the others. Um, the second one is ability to iterate uh, and separate like, developer uh, velocity on working on each one of these individual uh, components. So let's say we are making a fix to um, Flink to our uh, Flink SQL implementation. Uh, we don't need to go through uh, like ten different application upgrade that. Uh, we just bump the version in our uh, manage the system, and they will uh, all like the users that are using it will just take the the fix. Um, and so like then it comes also monitoring. Uh, um, there are like several reasons why I, I think it's a pretty good model. Um, so that that's kind of uh, is why. Um, it also plays also very well when it comes to sharing uh, multi-tenant clusters because the way we actually share clusters is we collocate jobs of the same application in one cluster. So we don't have like a SQL job and a connector in the same cluster. We have all SQL queries in the same cluster all Cassandra uh, sync connector uh, jobs into the same cluster and same for data lake, redshift and so on. So the collocation allows us to specialize the cluster for the specific task. So maybe you have a, task, a cluster that requires a larger state, you will use maybe specific instance types uh, or you, you will use specific uh, um, state uh, backend configuration to kind of optimize that specific use case. Okay, so I think time is up. Um, I would like to thank all the panelists for their insights. It was very interesting. Um, and maybe we can stay around for a few minutes for any offline questions from the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you.